Hi, and welcome back. This is Disability Saves the World with Dr. Fadi Shinuda. I am Fadi Shinuda. This podcast brings you insights from leading experts in disability and math studies from around the world. You'll hear about the research and work of disabled scholars, artists, activists, and our allies. You'll also get some insight into their lives, their favorite non-DS activities, hobbies, and adventures. Most importantly, however, you'll get to hear how they think disability can save the world. My name again is Fadi Shinuda. I use he, him pronouns. I'm an assistant professor in the Pauline Jewett Institute of Women's and Gender Studies at Carleton University, unceded Algonquin territory. On today's show, I'm joined by Megan Linton, a PhD student of the Department of Sociology and Political Economy at Carleton University, and Sarah Jamma, co-founder and executive director of the Disability Justice Network of Ontario in Hamilton, Ontario. I'm really excited to speak with them about their new campaign to abolish long-term care in Canada. So let's get started. Sarah, if you could tell us a little bit about what the Disability Justice Network of Ontario is and why you felt like you needed to start it. Yeah, so the DJNO is based in Hamilton, Ontario, which has uh, the largest density per capita of disabled people in the province. Um, Disability justice as a framework has been talked a lot about in terms of like the philosophy of disability justice and how we need to care for one another. But in terms of like an organizing framework, there hasn't really been much implemented in Canada. And so I think the creation of DJNO uh, was my friends and I getting together saying, you know, there's not a lot of space for organizers who are disabled and racialized and black to work together to create the spaces that we wanna see. So we're really interested in, in, in building up the capacity and, and youth who are dis, uh, disabled to sort of challenge systems and build out theories of change and say like, we're tired of asking for help um, because normally folks are told to ask for help whenever they wanna see change. And we don't wanna do that anymore. We wanna create the changes that we wanna see and directly challenge systems and move away from talking about inclusion and toward challenging our education systems our criminal justice systems, um, our political systems that continuously harm us um, and, and institutionalize us and, and, and take away our autonomy and our ability to have space or political influence. And yeah, build that capacity in, in young people to no longer be asking for help and to demand what it is they wanna see changed. Um, whether it was like municipal snow removal campaigns that have been successful um, to you know getting involved in you know, electoral campaigns to like strong arming public health in our city to create the first ever priority clinics in Ontario for black racialized and disabled people in Hamilton. We were the first city in Ontario to do that. Go outside of the scope of Ford's uh, recommendations. Uh, We did that. We delivered food and care packages through the beginning of the pandemic to immunocompromised disabled and racialized people who couldn't get to the store because of COVID and the food banks has shut down. So we're constantly thinking about, okay, how do we move away from begging systems to help us and more toward like building out the systems that we wanna see uh, changed for ourselves. And yeah, I think that's why it was created uh, and we're gonna continue doing that work. It just seems like you've done so much in so little uh, time. You've only been around for, is it a couple of years, five years or so? Uh, Less than that. We were officially launched in 2018. I'm wondering if you could tell us how um, before COVID and during COVID, activism has had to change in Hamilton. Yeah, before COVID, we were doing a lot more um, in-person meetings. So we had like a campaign committee that would meet consistently once a month in public at the public library where anybody could just drop in. And so that was a great way to like have disabled people connect and really decide to take on campaigns. So they like decided on snow removal. They decided on a campaign to like reform the assistive devices program. We took a bunch of people to Queens Park to, uh, you know, try to get a motion move there. Like that was all driven by this campaigns committee. Um, But since the pandemic, it's been a lot harder to meet people 
of where they're at and it's it's been it's been a lot harder to be proactive about issues so since the pandemic we've been like responding to different crises instead of just like creating like proactive spaces for people to like build out theories of changes so we pivoted immediately day three of the pandemic and said oh crap like people won't be able to get to food like food stores if they're immunocompromised and food banks aren't delivering and the city is not picking up our calls uh, to ask questions about what to do so we'll do it ourselves and we delivered food to like over 7,000 families uh, and you know people who are disabled are were being mass evicted and continue to be mass evicted Hamilton Ontario is one of the top three most expensive cities in Canada now even though it's a working class city even though it shouldn't be the case even though it has a high density of disabled people, it's it, people are being kicked out of their homes for rent evictions. Uh, eviction rates have gone up 96% in the last like seven years now, according to Liliana Farha, who is the former housing rapporteur uh, for the UN. And so what we see is disabled people being kicked out of their homes, ending up in our shelter systems or in parks. And so now a lot of our energy has been spent on like meeting disabled people who are living in tents, living in the most precarious situations and trying to meet those needs directly, rather than you know, building out, building uh, that political will and base that we were starting to initially. Um, it's been a lot of like responding. And it's unfortunate that like disabled people are the ones who have to like continue to fill these gaps, but we're gonna do it because it's needed. Um, right now, what I know is that in the Barton jail, which is like the biggest jail in Hamilton, um, about 20 people have been denied their medications uh, who are disabled. And so we're also trying our best to respond to those needs um, and support people in there. But it's a lot of like responding immediately to conditions that people in positions of power continue to perpetuate. We have had disabled people also banned from shelters um, for being disruptive, which is like ableist framing. So you have like people who are in crisis, who are being told to behave a certain way or to stop using or change who they are and how they function in order to access a bed for a night. That's fundamentally ableist. And so trying to get the city to see their ableist policy framing is continuing to leave people out into the street to die because people cannot change their bodies overnight and what they need uh, and shouldn't have to in order to like get a bed and stay alive. Uh, so yeah, there are all these fires that we are trying to put out now, um, rather than investing in, you know, building the beautiful futures that we want to see, which was the initial intention. Um, and I don't know, this is my first time running an organization, so it can kind of be overwhelming, because maybe like online, it doesn't look like we're doing a lot, but I, it's it's been really difficult to try to like, manage all of these things on top of yeah, other crises is going on locally too around policing that I tend to be involved in. So yeah, it's been a lot. I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope to get back to a point where um, we're able to challenge people's thinking and challenge people in positions of power rather than allowing them to continue to put us in these positions where we're meeting gaps that we have not been equipped to fill because we're not a nonprofit. Um, we're a bunch of people trying to fill gaps that we don't have the tools to fill and it's not sustainable as it is right now. That's my honest like breakdown of how things are functioning. Uh, I feel like that was a very fulsome answer and I really appreciate this idea of having to shift from you know planned approaches right planned campaigns to um, really managing crises and I feel like Megan in some ways um, your research is also a response to a crisis, right? Is the crisis that we've come here to talk about long-term care. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about your research interests, right? Um, um, and also how they've been affected by, you know, COVID and, and what we've seen in long-term care. Yeah, for sure. Um, so when I began my master's, my research was supposed to be looking at um, access to sexuality for people, um, for disabled people. Um, and I really started by looking at or trying to look at where disabled people live, because I think, um, as we all know, like that's often where we have sex or sexual culture begins or escalates to um, and so forth. And um, in 
in that process, I learned just because I'm from Manitoba, I started to like understand what the current systems were like in Ontario. Um, and so seeing that congregate housing and institutional forms of care continued to be um, the dominant form of housing while being reported as being in a province that has like quote unquote deinstitutionalized or closed its like large scale disability institutions. Um, and so through that, it was like March 10th, 2019, um, or yeah, what, what is time? 2020. <laughs> when did the pandemic start? Um, and like three days before the pandemic, um, like was officially declared in Canada and we all locked down. I was giving a presentation at a conference about just how terrible our data systems were for these um, really congregate settings. And I remember like feeling incredibly panicked about it um, in case there was a crisis and something needed to be done. Um, and then like three days after that, that Friday, the province closed and um, pretty soon I realized that no one was going to be tracking or tracing the COVID-19 deaths and outbreaks in these settings. Um, and so I really like shifted my research to be focusing on like how many people were living in these settings, how many institutions were currently operating and how our current system of institutionalization was really like built off of this desire to remove and segregate disabled people. And that's still the way that we continue to operate. Um, and through my research, we are able to like, so the first thing was that um, lots of these spaces are just like completely misunderstood. And I was really frustrated by that specifically, um, how we only started talking about long-term care and pretended that those were the only institutions that were in outbreaks when we know, and it's so abundantly clear that psychiatric wards and psychiatric institutions, um, retirement homes and unregulated systems like um, rooming houses and other types of institutions like group homes um, were just being forgotten. And so I really started um, like writing and publicizing my research. And that's how I got connected with Sarah um, was through like really understanding the pandemic as a site of eugenics that we are currently living through and those eugenics being built by these institutional systems that have been like fundamental to disabled people's lives in Ontario since colonization um, and disabled people's lives across Canada, which is that of institutionalizing, that of subjecting people to conditions of um, mass infection and eventually mass death. Um, and so, yeah, that's really how we got started. Um, one of the things that just became so apparent um, in my research and in the like horrific stats that we've seen from across Canada is that institutionalization has never ended. Um, Deinstitutionalization has never been a complete project. And the only way that we're going to get to a place of safety, a place of justice and a place of um, liberation is through closing these institutions and through radically changing the way that we understand um, disabled people and community supports and community living. And so I'm wondering, um, how did you get started on this campaign, um, this call to abolish long-term care? How did that come about? So I think like as the tragedy of long-term care really became apparent, it became quite clear that um, reformers and like liberal kind of disability rights and um, seniors rights organizations were going to get um, the like vast majority of media coverage and their critiques of long-term care didn't at all consider um, the complex system of carceral ableism that long-term care is built on. So we saw a lot of demands for like increased staff numbers for um, like mass publicization, for um, like access to video calls and things like that. And, and they were really 
um, reforms and demands that weren't going to actually improve the lives of the people living there. Um, I think the most clear example of that is that hardly any of them actually acknowledge the incarcerated people living within the institution. And instead, the reforms are always the, the people working there or the people entering or the people who are the administrators and the, the lobbyists. And so if we're not centering disabled voices and not centering disabled experiences of long-term care um, and are instead focused on just employment, then that is a fundamental failure because the people who are being, um, who are dying on mass and the people who are being subject to such suffering on mass are disabled people and are um, the multiply marginalized people who are living in long-term care institutions and who have never been able to fully escape our system and cycle of institutionalization. Sarah, I wonder if you have anything to add to that about um, starting the campaign at DJNO. Uh, I think Megan has been talking about this for as long as I've known her and really being like, we got to say something. But for me, I, I really started to understand it when I got roped in the conversation about medical assistance and dying and the expansion of that at the peak of the pandemic, right? Because on the one hand, you have a government who is saying that, you know, disabled people, only disabled people should have the right to, to die um, at the hands of doctors, even if they're not terminally ill. No one else in the country has that right, except for disabled people. Um, because, you know, being disabled equates suffering. And then you had people online saying that, you know, I would rather die, I would rather access medical assistance and dying than live in a long-term care home. And then you had people like Chris Gladders who chose medical assistance and dying as a disabled person in his thirties um, over, you know, what was currently his condition at that time, which was sitting in his feces and urine for, for days at a time, right? And, and he chose to die rather than live in these institutions. And it begs the question, why, right? Why have we created a, a society where it's okay to talk about giving people an out in order to not allow them to live in those terrible conditions rather than better those terrible conditions? Why do we live in a country where somebody's right to die is, is financially more of a supported option by people in power than our right to live? Why is Down syndrome, the life of someone with Down syndrome, not really funded in Canada, but prenatal screening is extremely funded? And, when, and I'm pro-choice in life and in death, but when you have a government and people in power who make financial decisions one way versus another way, that's not a choice that's you know, funded eugenics. And it's funded eugenics when you have an entire system of people who are forced into long-term care who would be able to live elsewhere if they had the financial ability to, to receive um, pharmacare, home care, and the supports that they need to live. It, it's, it's eugenics when they're being forced into a system away from their family and friends and community because money is the main issue. And instead of the government investing in those at-home situations, which was talked about on different levels of government, people have talked about pharma care and voted it down. People have talked about expanding home care and voted it down. What you have now is a long-term care system that's collapsing during a global pandemic where most of the people who have experienced death and hardship are living in long-term care homes. We saw stories of even doorknobs being removed, right? So that people were locked into these situations. Um, it's, it's not a situation that anyone wants to be in. And so for me, long-term care, uh, the conversation of long-term care really became serious for me when we started talking about medical assistance and dying. And I saw how easy it was for society to dispose of people like us. And I worried about ending up in a long-term care home myself in like 40 years um, and being in the exact same situation where I too would choose medical assistance and dying as someone who's against that expansion over being in a situation like that. So it, it feels very intimate because there's so many people that I know and care about and love who either are in that situation or would be because they can't afford to not be. And this is eugenics and, and 
it's a, an attack on poor people and it's attack, an, an attack on disabled people in our communities. And our government is shirking their responsibilities by consistently talking about nationalization without acknowledging that 90% of the long-term care homes in Quebec right now are, are public, publicly funded. Um, and, and publicly funded institutions, publicly run institutions, don't absolve um, decision makers from the violence and the lack of care in these places. Sorry for ranting. No, I, I appreciate the rant. I love the rant. I think, you know, um, I'm learning new terms here. There's this, uh, you know, or we're introducing an audience potentially to, to new terms here. Megan, you talked about carceral ableism. Sarah, you talked about this idea of like funded eugenics, right, which is kind of a new term for me. I wonder uh, to understand these terms a little bit more, if you could describe for us, what is long term care for those who don't know? Um, what does it specifically look like in Canada? Who lives in long term care? Um, um, and, and why is this the system we've ended up with? Um, that's a great question. And I can get really nerdy here. So <laughs> bear with me, but get nerdy. Um, so, I mean, fundamentally, it's important to go into and begin this by understanding that long-term care isn't a system for older people. Long-term care is a system that is exclusively designed for disabled people. So the thing that is connecting every single person who's institutionalized into the long-term care sector isn't that they're 80, because we know that a wealthy 80 year old living at home with access to services, is going to be considerably better off than a 30 year old who's um, been institutionalized into the long term care sector, or into the emergency shelter sector or into any form of institutional sector. Um, and so we know that disability is really here, the connecting fiber of every single resident and every single experience in long-term care. Long-term care itself, um, we know is mostly made up of older people because um, as you age, that's when the vast majority of chronic illness and chronic injury or um, so forth happens. As younger disabled people here, we know that that also of course does not happen um, just over time and that if you are someone who experiences the intersections of racialization, uh, disability, and class, then you're going to be much more likely to be institutionalized into these settings. So almost 90% of long-term care residents are older, are over the age of 70. But we also know that across Canada, there's 230 children living in long-term care. And in Ontario alone, there's 2,900 people who are institutionalized into long-term care because they have a developmental or intellectual disability or were labeled with such. Um, and so if we go back and look at how long-term care started, it becomes quite clear how it maintains its place as what Sarah called funded eugenics um, because long-term care really rose to prominence in like the 1950s. And at that time, it was first and foremost a way to privatize a large piece of the healthcare system. And, and secondly, it became a way to, when institutions were being critiqued, like psychiatric institutions and institutions for people with developmental disabilities, it became a place to transfer people. And so as it became less common to have older people in developmental disability institutions, they were just by and large mass transferred into for-profit long-term care institutions that were being developed. Um, and so we see this really early on that institutions and long-term care institutions are a way to generate profit for the state by um, the incarceration of disabled bodies and the privatization of um, disability. And so as the long-term care industry has expanded, of course, over the last like 60 years, we know that neoliberalism has just sought to um, underfund it as much as possible and generate as much profit as possible from these sites, regardless if they are nonprofit or for profit, because we know that even the executive directors of nonprofit long term care homes and the doctors that work there make substantial wealth off of the, the lives of disabled people who are living in those institutions. 
Um, and so uh, long-term care today operates as what m- many people think of as a choice, as a place to put people. Um, but long-term care is never a choice because we don't fund anything else in our healthcare system. Long-term care is a coerced option and a coerced state of living. And so we know that, um, as I started with, like an 80 year old who is living at home, he isn't choosing to live in long-term care because we know that 97% of people don't want to live in long-term care and it's, it's not a choice. And so when people are incarcerated into the long-term care sector, it's not because they're choosing to go there. It's because the government is separating them from their families, removing them from their communities and placing them in a place where they think their care services will charge the least and where they think that they'll still have, um, this is what um, Marta Russell always says is like, uh, disabled lives are worth more in a nursing home bed than out of it. And so long-term care is just another way to really continue that cycle and that system. And so um, does long-term care include things like private nursing homes or retirement homes or senior homes or those kinds of spaces or are those things different? Um, I think that they're, they're all really the same and all really united under the auspices of disability confinement. And so um, we see lots of these different places that often have different names, whether it's nursing homes or retirement villages or retirement homes um, or long-term care homes. Um, But they're all really united in their pursuit of removing disabled people from their communities, segregating them only with other disabled people and isolating them in in settings of suffering. Um, There there is of course some differences, um, particularly with regulation in terms of that. I think like the differences in names actually show really the limits of nationalizing long-term care because we know that carceral ableism or the desire to um, institutionalize disabled people will transform with whatever is um, and whatever will maintain profits. So we know that there aren't institutions for developmental disability in Ontario anymore, but instead are called group homes or domiciliary hostels or supportive living settings or um, tranquil, whatever, whatever their names may be. Um, And they all have different names, but that's why we're demanding a complete abolition of long-term care and the systems that maintain it. And those systems of capitalism, of racism, and of um, really ableism. And I think probably the different names is on purpose, right? It's, it's, a, it's, I think it's a tool to obfuscate from what's actually happening to somehow distinguish them from one another. But when you say that they're all part of this larger system, I think it's really helpful. One of the things that I find helpful in like identifying these sites of institutionalization is that they have their own funding regime. So if you're living in long-term care, you don't have access to, to disability supports. You only have access to institutional supports. And so if you're a person living in a long-term care institution or a retirement home or a domiciliary hostel, um, you're all receiving $140 a month and that's it. And so we really see how they're connected through not only this type of um, removed confinement, but also through enforced poverty um, within these places of confinement. Can you tell us how these communities or how the the persons living in um, long-term care were affected during COVID? Yeah, so um, COVID-19 really began in Canada um, in a nursing home in BC and a group home in Ontario. And it became really evident really early on that these would be sites of mass infection and mass death. We knew this because during the SARS epidemic or pandemic in the 2000s, nursing homes and long-term care homes during the SARS pandemic, but also every flu season, we know that long-term care homes and group homes and congregate living settings are places of 
really high death and really high infection. And it really quickly became normalized just how fast and just how deadly COVID would be in these settings. Um, and so we know that the vast majority of deaths within Canada from COVID-19 happened within congregate settings, happened within long-term care institutions specifically. Um, and then also in other sites of incarceration like prisons and um, group homes and, and congregate living settings. So COVID-19 resulted in um, it's be believed to be significantly underreported, but at least 15,000 deaths in residential facilities. Um, and this represented the largest number of deaths. And also um, compared to other OECD countries, this is the worst performance within the within um, it, countries that have a healthcare system. So um, we can really see just how deadly it was. We also know that when people weren't dying within these institutions, they were subject to really horrific conditions, um, subject to laying in their feces and urine for days at a time, um, were removed their right to and access to showering and toileting in lots of cases. They were force fed um, to the point where they were, residents were force fed to the point where they were choking um, and dying from that force feeding and also from other natural causes or unnatural causes like dehydration, like neglect, like lack of access to medication. Um, and what we also know is that COVID-19 resulted in like the mass overprescription of antipsychotic medications um, used against residents to restrain them, used against residents to ensure that they were being um, complicit and not a problem. Um, and we also know that people living within long-term care were prevented from seeing anyone, were prevented from accessing family and friends and support um, workers. For many people, their last experience was that of trauma and of violence and of neglect. And that is what we enforced on people by deciding to maintain this eugenical system of institutionalization. Thank you for painting, um, you know, a full picture of the impact. Um, it's, I think it's really helpful for folks to understand completely what is, what has happened. And of course, you've just provided kind of a snapshot, but it was very fulsome. I wonder if you can tell us, and maybe this question is silly at this point, because really, what is there to do but abolish long-term care? But why are you calling for this? Why are you calling to abolish this system? I think that we're calling to abolish long-term care um, because we want to be able to move the conversation away from nationalizing. So the government has said that there are issues. We know that um, COVID-19 has like disproportionately impacted disabled people in long-term care and um, as Megan calls them, congregate care settings. And so the conversation to abolish long-term care is meant to push the conversation along and away from nationalization. As Megan alluded to before, a lot of the current public discourse around long-term care is the fact that we need to be paying healthcare workers more, but not really interrogating or even speaking to people who have lived in long-term care who who are talking about the real abuses and struggles that they have living in those systems. And so this conversation to, to abolish long-term care is asking the public to question, what else is possible? How did we get to this point in time where we are okay as a society with continuing to shove people out, in, out away from our communities? And how do we bring this back? How do we build a society and rebuild a society where disabled people are loved and cared for? Um, by their communities, by their friends, by their families? And what will it take from different levels of government in order to do so in a way that doesn't center healthcare workers or people in positions of power or lobbyists, but instead centers those who are at the center of this conversation, uh, disabled people. And so we're asking to deinstitutionalize, to stop public spending on the construction of new long-term care institutions or building more beds and investing in private sectors. We're asking for the end of the use of long-term care 
for the 23,650 disabled people under the age of 65 across Canada, because what Megan talked about before is super important. It's not just people at the end of their lives who are shoved away into these institutions. There are people who are simply in there um, from like their early 20s, early 30s, because they're disabled and cannot afford the care, the health care that they need to, to receive in their own communities. And Megan can talk about this some more because she's in direct conversation with people who have um, recently won um, a civil suit to say like, no, we have the right to be in our communities. Um, but yeah, we're asking for uh, people uh, at least under the age of 65 across Canada to be let out immediately. We're asking for um, deadly institutions to be shut down and to not be replaced with new ones. We're asking also to create voluntary accessible community run services, um, asking for access to just care work and public infrastructures. We're also asking to re uh, reimagine the Canada Health Act to nationalize home care, palliative care, pharmacare, and funding for assistive devices. All things that disabled people were talking about before this pandemic, but especially during the conversation around medical assistance and dying. People were screaming at the top of their lungs, if I could afford food, if I could afford my medication, if I could afford accessible places to live, not only would I not consider uh, going to long-term care homes, I would not consider having to end my life, but it's treacherous to exist in these conditions without these funded supports. And the Liberal government continues to vote these policies that are put forward down. So these conversations are not new. We're also asking to expropriate housing from corporate landlords in order to make rapid investments in the development of public accessible and affordable housing. We're talking too much about affordable housing without real conversations on what that means on the ground and without any attention to the lack of accessible housing in Ontario. Right now, accessible housing isn't really a standard in the accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act. So all people have to refer to is a couple of lines in the building code, but there's nothing really pushing municipal governments, developers, or anyone to invest in the creation of accessible and affordable housing. And there's no real understanding of what affordability means because affordability, just somebody making like $60,000 a year is very different than the affordability um, that needs to be given to somebody living on the Ontario Disability Support Program who cannot work due to disability. Right? And so we need to be having these conversations and we need the political will and courage from people in power to expropriate, to take land back from shitty developers, from shitty landlords who are pushing disabled people out, who are living on social assistance and turn that into accessible, affordable, and dare I say, free housing for those who cannot afford it. Um, and so these are the things that we're asking for because with these things in place, you know, the need or, or presented need for, you know, the institutionalization of disabled people disappears entirely. Um, and this conversation we're hoping will push our political leaders, even the progressive ones who are getting this wrong, who are talking about nationalization over and over again, who were voting for, and I say progressives very uh, intentionally, who are voting for um, my, like our right to die instead of our right to live over and over and over again, even in the made conversation. We're hoping that this dialogue, that this campaign will give people the political courage to, to say otherwise, to act otherwise, and really continue to invest in what it is we're asking for instead of what they assume our needs are. Can I just add a quick point to the last? Um, yeah, I think I think along with, or maybe before what Sarah said, um, is the fact that we need to abolish long-term care because removing people and segregating them into institutions will always fundamentally put disabled lives at risk. And there's no mechanism for improving institutions. We know this when we look at prisons that have been a project of reform for the last 200 years. Um, and so we know that you cannot reform an institution. And the only way you can respond to these institutions of violence, of eugenics, of segregation is by abolishing them. And we know that moving forward, our goals have to be such that, or I think disability justice calls for goals that are not just 
mildly improving the lives of people, but instead radically reimagining our futures to be futures of community where disabled people are everywhere in our communities and not just in the institutional ward of city zoning and where disabled people are able to access the supports that they need outside of settings designed to segregate and kill them. Um, and so abolishing long-term care is really the only option when we look at changing the lives of disabled people and changing the lives of all of us because all of our lives are improved when there's disabled people around. Thank you both so much for that. And I think, you know, when people listen to this and when they see the campaign as it rolls out on uh, the DJNO website, I wonder um, if you can tell them a little bit about how they can get involved. So the first thing is definitely to share and read the, the petition that we have drafted the petition right now, you can send it to your political leaders. Um, and I think it's really important that we show that there is an appetite for this large scale change. And so we have to begin to have these conversations with our communities, with our unions, with our leaders, um, and, and start to develop those tactics and those skills of community and of disability justice. So what does it look like to build communities where disabled people are everywhere? What does it look like to challenge our union to the campaigns that it's launching around institutionalization and around long-term care? Um, and I think that those are just a couple steps, but right now I think the conversation is so focused on publicization, so focused on nationalization that we're not getting creative, that we're not getting to the place that will change the world. Um, and I, I think that really just starting these conversations, contributing to the campaign um, through your signature it is really important and necessary work. What are your hopes for the campaign uh, as it moves forward? What are some of the next steps? Um, I think that the hope is in part that the public becomes aware of just how toxic these systems are and and becomes aware of the fact that like disabled people don't want to be in these institutions and neither do you, right? Um, it's very likely that you too will be disposed of someday in, in one system or another, in one institution or another, because at the end of the day, the system was built um, to say that once you are no longer productive, once you are no longer to hold a job, able to hold a job, you should be disposed of. And so to try to get the, the public to understand that piece that we're all implicated, that we can all be harmed by these systems, um, whether you're outside them right now or not, whether your loved ones are in there right now or not, and then trying to get ahead of the next election cycle. You have a lot of political leaders right now gearing up for uh, the next provincial election this summer. Um, and this conversation needs to be at the forefront. It's no longer okay for Doug Ford to, to disappear, to show up with toy shovels and try to dig individuals out of you know, snow banks when his long-term care minister is MIA has stepped down. Right? and hasn't in really engaged in these meaningful conversations. We no longer want um, you know, fake platitudes, fake demonstrations of care and support. What we need is real political will, real political courage, and real political capacity, which hasn't been shown. And so hopefully this campaign gives people the language and the comfort and confidence to really critique the root issues. Because I do think the general public cares. I do think the general public is paying attention to the issue, but I think what's missing is, you know, what is possible, a conversation of what should come next. And hopefully the launch of this campaign will, will equip people to be able to have these conversations properly past, uh, you know, these um, surface level conversations of we need to respect our healthcare workers and more toward what actually needs to change about these systems ahead of the next election cycle. I think, Along with that is um, the, the shift to these conversations of 
um, the nationalization of healthcare, the nationalization of pharma care and of home care and of disability supports, assistive devices. I think like one of the things that feels so challenging right now is that our only efforts involving long-term care right now are so siloed from the current issues, the current um, crisis around housing, the current crisis around um, overdose and addiction, and the current crisis around pharmaceuticals and medical assistance in dying is um, definitely part of this crisis as well. And so shifting those conversations to begin centering disability and to begin centering um, what we need to survive. And so that looks like, again, like calling on our unions to not get involved in nationalizing long-term care, but instead calling on them to get involved in the nationalization of home care, to get involved in campaigns demanding access to pharmaceuticals and demanding access to support services. And if we continue to just dump money only on institutional forms of care, then we're gonna keep failing and we're gonna keep killing people. And instead we need to demand that type of money, that type of funding and that type of support into those options, the home care, community supports and housing that are going to keep us safe and are going to challenge the, the status quo so fundamentally. Thank you both so much. And people can learn more about the campaign, sign the petition, um, and really learn about um, long-term care on the DJNO website, which is just djno.ca. And of course, we'll link it um, at the bottom of the podcast with all the other information. We always end all the podcasts by um, asking a question about um, how disability can save the world. I wonder if you can both take about a minute or two to tell us um, what do you think, how do you interpret that question? I think, you know, a lot of people theorize about the problems of capitalism and how capitalism has killed people across the world and continues to cause great harm to like our physical and emotional psyche over and over and over again. But there hasn't really been a framework in terms of how to rebuild a world that doesn't rely on capitalism, except for disability justice, because it forces us to reckon with the idea that, you know, some people cannot fit in the way our current society is built. Some people cannot work, right? Some people cannot work and that doesn't mean they don't have value and should be disposed of. And in fact, everybody at some point in their life will be unable to work and be seen as productive. And so by understanding that piece and rebuilding a society where that's not the focal point where it's okay to survive and to live um, and you're supported in doing that without having to work, um, without having to feed back into this capitalist system uh, that says that that's where your worth is derived from. It, it creates this room for people to just be able to reimagine like an entire system, like economically in terms of what that could look like. And I think that's how disability justice will save the world by forcing us to reckon with the fact that, you know, the people who are experiencing the brunt of the harm in the way things are set up right now are and will always be disabled people. And so we have no choice but to reckon with that because disability makes up the largest uh, population in terms of like race, disability, uh, geographic location, uh, gender, like disabled people are everywhere. We're the largest, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, group of people, constituency, or whatever you want to call it, in, in the world. And yet we are consistently the most silenced over and over and over again. And so by understanding that and understanding our political will and our capacity to force change uh, outside of like regular engaging in systems and reforming it, like we can take power back we can push the system and we actually have the ability to fight for a better system and understanding that and our power in a world that consistently says that we don't have any power is, is the main step to really undermining and overthrowing the current violent system that we live in. And disability justice is the only, and I say this as someone who has done a lot of work around anti-Black racism and, and a whole bunch of other issues like, 
this framework of understanding our political systems is the only one that actually gives us a framework and a tool set to like moving forward and building a world that fits all of us. Um, I think that how disability will save the world is that disabled communities have been creating systems of care outside of institutions for so long and we will be able and disability brilliance and disability hacking and disability um, creativity will be what is necessary to move us away from these systems of institutionalization and towards futures without institutions, without carceral systems, and without long-term care. And I think that that will change the world. Thank you both for those fulsome answers. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us about the campaign. I really appreciate it. Thank you again. Uh, thank you for having us. This was an awesome conversation and we need to be having more of it. Thank you so much for having us today. Thanks to Sarah Jama and Megan Linton for coming on the show. Get in touch by sending us an email at disabilitysavestheworld at gmail.com. If you're interested in learning more about me, check out my website, fadishinuda.com. This podcast is hosted and produced by Fadi Shinuda and edited by Yasmina Garcia. Thank you for listening and see you next time on Disability Saves the World.